Welcome back to uh, History and Coffee. And uh, you may notice I got my uh, big mug out here today. And uh, that's because we're going to do something a little different. Um, I actually went on Facebook and I asked some of you guys uh, to give me some topics. And, um, you know, you got on there and I got, you know, a shitload. But, you know, I selected eight uh, topics that I could cover briefly. And, um, I'm going to go ahead and do that sort of like a Q&A type thing. So, uh, now if I didn't get to your topic, uh, there's two reasons. One, I don't know shit about it. Or two, uh, it deserves its own video. So, uh, could go either way. <laughs> All right. So, I'm going to get into these topics now. And some of these are kind of border on conspiracy, conspiracy, and some of them are uh, sort of philosophical in nature, so I'm going to try to, uh, you know, do these justice. I've got some bad handwriting here. So first, we got a, a question from uh, Marco, who's our graphic design whiz. He's responsible for the um, thumbnails and shit on my videos. So, uh, you know, definitely a lot of props to him. And he was asking me, hey, what's the deal with this... Uh, the Glocka or the uh, the Nazi bell, um, and if you don't know, this is a um, kind of a uh, what was reported to be a Nazi wonder weapon that was a top secret project during World War II. Um, essentially, um, it was some sort of experiment with like uh, alternative energy and like anti gravity, you know, whatever. Um, and, and, you know, we don't really know anything about this, really. The only source we actually have on this subject is uh, from a Polish journalist uh, who, who uh, came up with this topic. And, um, of course, he states that his source um, for all this was uh, he was allowed to sit in on the interrogation of a captured uh, uh, SS officer who was uh, overseeing these experiments. And uh, his original description was this object was metal. It was bell-shaped. It was around 9 feet wide and 15 feet tall. And um, it was meant to be um, a source of uh, sort of perpetual energy. Uh, he stated that inside the bell there were two cylinders filled with like a mercury-like substance and they would um, rotate. Um, and when they did this this whole bell thing would lift up off the ground and emit um, energy, you know, all by itself. So, <laughs> you know, now there was a downside to this. Um, the bell, when it was on, had this uh, sphere of influence around it uh, and all this weird shit would happen in there. And this, of course, is according to this um, this Polish journalist. I, I can't remember the guy's name offhand. Again, you know, I do all this shit from memory, so if I'm wrong about something, please, you know, drop a comment. <laughs> I'd be happy to uh, <clears throat> release some correction videos. So within this sphere of uh, influence of the bell, uh, strange shit would happen. Plants were reported to melt into a gray, uh, like a gray ooze. Uh, crystal structures would form in animal tissue. People would have psychiatric sort of crazy shit go on and... Of course, you know, it, it makes for really cool sci-fi, but there really isn't any single, there's one single source of this, and it's this Polish journalist, and, and they've never been able to find any sort of corroborating testimony. They've never even been able to locate this supposed SS scientist. So while it's really cool, it's most likely bullshit, I hate to say. So uh, the next question is, um, uh, could you tell me about the lost colony of Roanoke? So this is a cool one. Um, back in uh, 1585, um, a private group of uh, British explorers and contractors and things like that decided to uh, establish a colony um, on the uh, on Roanoke Island there, which is off the coast of uh, North Carolina. And um, when they came back to resupply the company or the colony uh, after it had been established, uh, they were gone, um, completely gone. Um, the the houses, equipment, everything was just 
like it was never there. Um, so, the only clues that were left behind, people being there at all, was the uh, word Croatan was uh, carved into a tree and they found a, uh, a rusty old sea chest and a, I believe a saber lying on the ground in the area. Now that sounds weird and it's spawned all kinds of shit about aliens and, you know, Native American curses and all this crap, but what really happened, <laughs> at least the most popular uh, belief. Now mind you, this colony was established in 1585 it was a hundred, a couple hundred people, and then they didn't, they were not able to get back to this colony for five years to resupply it. So that's five years of time that, that went by. We don't know what happened. And when they came back, of course, everything was gone. Uh, the word Croatan um, was a local tribe. Um, now, mind you, this colony had had some issues with the, the local Native Americans. Uh, there was sort of a, a, a kind of a hostility there, and um, conventional belief is that they got involved in tribal warfare. Um, most of the members of the colony were killed, and the remaining um, actually went and sort of intermingled with this Croatan tribe. And uh, it's interesting that if you read uh, period accounts, there was lots of people, of course, this was a big deal um, to the, uh, the early American colonists. Um, this, this became this huge myth thing. There was lots of books about it. There was even a, a, a very popular uh, play produced that went all, all around the world, um, or early Broadway, <laughs> about the, you know, the fate of this tribe. Um, people would write accounts of seeing, whenever they'd encounter this Croatan tribe, they would uh, see, you know, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Indians running around with them. And, uh, you know, of course, that... You know, that, that would um, suggest uh, intermingling, intermarrying, interbreeding, things like that with uh, European populations. So that's the most accepted um, belief, is that they just, they got their ass whooped in an Indian war and then said, F it. You know, and I asked to where all their structures went. Of course, back then you're not going to, uh, you know, if you take the time to cut and form timbers by hand to build structures, you're not going to just leave them there and then do that all over again they probably dismantled their colony when they left and took took all the shit with them and then of course the uh, the second most accepted explanation is that there was uh, some sort of uh, natural disaster maybe a big hurricane or something like that that could have wiped the colony out more sound effects <laughs> it wiped the colony out and they um they then, of course, went and moved with this uh, friendly Croatan tribe. So that's your uh, your Roanoke colony. Um, the next uh, question is kind of a philosophical one, and uh, this is a, a delicate subject, but I'm going to do my best to um, explain my opinion of it. This is not the truth. This is not a black and white subject. This is just everyone has an opinion. And it's, uh, is the Confederate flag racist? So. Well, there's a couple of different things you have to consider when it comes to um, accusing inanimate objects of malicious intentions. <laughs> now, of course, the Confederate flag, or the one that we know now as the Confederate flag, is actually a Confederate battle flag. It was specific to a couple of units and not an overall symbol of the Confederacy. The actual Confederate flag is a lot different than um, the one that's been popularized. Uh, second, now of course that represents the Confederacy. Um, the Confederacy, specifically the Articles of Confederation, which was their version of the Constitution, was very specific about not giving African Americans rights and of course justifying and legalizing slavery. And that is racist. But, again, we're talking about an inanimate object. And, of course, symbolism. Symbolism is a fluid subject. Now, I could sit here and say, your Che Guevara shirt is racist. And you would say, well, why is that? 
and I could say, well, Che Guevara was very openly um, anti uh, black Cubans. In fact, if Castro had not stopped him, he would have happily rounded up every black Cuban citizen and executed them. And he talked about this at great length. So why does the Che Guevara shirt not receive the same sort of ire the Confederate flag does? Well, um, Che's image has come to symbolize uh, the struggle of the working class against the, you know, the bourgeoisie and all that shit. And the definition and really the, what the guy represents has changed. And this is also true of the Confederate flag. While the Confederate flag is the symbol of a racist ideology, it has come to symbolize Southern heritage and American history, and therefore I believe that the Confederate flag is not racist. Not any more so than a Che Guevara flag is racist, or a Soviet flag represents the Holodomer, or any of these other horrible things in history. It's simply symbolism. And we need to be tolerant of that fact, and we need to recognize that. All right. Next, tell me about Unit 731. This is a pretty horrific uh, subject from World War II. This was um, the height of, I guess, Japanese war crimes. Um, Unit 731, um, on the outside, was the... Um, well, the Japanese referred to it openly, or rather this was the cover of it, um, the Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification um, Center. This uh, was based in uh, northeast China. And what this was used for was human experimentation, specifically with like uh, things like hypothermia, uh, germ warfare, even things like the result of blunt force trauma. Um, over the course of operations under a general uh, Shiro Ishii, this, this unit murdered somewhere around 3,000 people. And they did so in some of the most horrifying ways imaginable that I'm not going to get into in the name of, you know, science, basically. Um, the Japanese did not see the Chinese as human beings, and they treated them like guinea pigs. Um, now, the 3,000 dead is just that we know about. We also know that they experimented with... Um, infecting fleas and things like that with bubonic plague and dropping them on the local populace from bombers. So that number could be very small uh, compared to the real one. We don't actually know. Um, it's also reported that some of the famous Wake Island defenders who were American POWs were um, also killed um, during these, the course of these experiments. And now the real injustice here, of course, is Operation Paperclip. Now, for those who don't know, um, Operation Paperclip was a um, this idea after the war that we were going to get all these Nazi and Japanese scientists and give them immunity in exchange for access to their research. Um, that's how we got um, Werner von Braun, who, of course, was the uh, the brilliant Nazi rocket scientist who uh, eventually invented the technology that allowed us to go to the moon in '69. So. Operation Paperclip comes along, and this sort of horror of Unit 731 is discovered. And instead of holding these people accountable, they give them all immunity, um, and they gain access to their research. So these guys got away unscathed. Um, and again, I'm not going to get into details, but this really gives the Nazis a run for their money uh, as far as uh, horrible shit. So, um, you know, look onto that. Look into that on your own if you're uh, have some kind of morbid curiosity there. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Next topic: What's the deal with all these conspiracies around Hitler's death? Did he die? Did he not die? Was he in South America? <laughs> you know, this is kind of interesting, and um, really, it has its roots in. Soviet propaganda immediately after World War II. Stalin took Hitler and essentially used him as the boogeyman. 
um, it was a, a way to control his population. Um, as long as Hitler was running around, he could do things like sacrifice people's well-being in the name of national defense and, you know, things like that. You know, don't, don't get a line or Hitler's going to come back type thing. You know, if we have any sort of civil unrest, Hitler's going to come back and seize on that. And Hitler, having shot himself, made this very inconvenient. So the, uh, the KGB got together and they um, would every once in a while release something like, oh, he was seen in uh, South, South America or, oh, he was seen running around, you know, Berlin dressed as a doctor or something like that. But essentially it was all Soviet propaganda. Hitler very much did assassin- kill himself in a bunker in, the, in Berlin at the very end of the war. And, um, you know, much like we use the threat of terrorism today to dismantle certain civil liberties, um, Stalin used the, the ghost of Hitler to uh, do the same in his country. So, yeah. <laughs> Next, uh, this is a this is an interesting subject. Um, you know, uh, somebody was like, "Hey, would you like to uh, describe to me MK Ultra?" And uh, honestly, I could do a video on this pretty much by itself. Um, it's uh, one of the more horrifying. Much like Unit 731, this was sort of our own version of that. And now it's remembered for some whatever reason or another as this CIA experiment with LSD. It's been sort of, um, I don't know exactly the word for it, but I guess downplayed. Um, people think that the, the CIA was going around giving college students LSD in an attempt to... Uh, research its side effects and if they could turn it into some sort of mind control thing. And that did take place, but that's not the real meat and potatoes of this MK Ultra thing. Now, this was started in uh, 1953. And of course, the, the idea here was to establish, um, it was a mind control experiment. They wanted to, uh, two outcomes, they wanted to be able to influence people's behavior and they wanted to create I don't know if you're familiar with the film Manchurian Candidate. They they wanted to brainwash people and turn them into assassins. That was the um, the idea, sort of hypnotic suggestion. And um, their intentions, um, or rather how they wanted to accomplish this, was by using a couple of different tactics. They used LSD. Um, they used sensory and sleep deprivation. They used hypnosis. And more disturbingly, verbal and sexual abuse. They would take people against their will from college campuses and subject them to this in an attempt to break their will and make them susceptible to suggestion. And this, again, this, this, this sort of second part here with the, the sexual abuse specifically was left out. And this was actually done to children, not just college students. They would, under the direction of the CIA, they would kidnap or tell the parents that, oh, we're going to do a medical exam or something like that, and they would horrifically abuse these children in an attempt to turn them into government assassins. <laughs> um, now, the public started to get wise to this, and the CIA director, a guy by the name of Richard Helms, um, figured out that if this ever got out, now, of course, the program was abandoned in 67. Say hi, Zabu. <laughs> the, the program was abandoned in 67 and um, they, they figured out if this ever got out that obviously it would be very bad the government going around drugging people against their will and sexually abusing them so this guy named Richard Helms um, decides that he's going to order all of the files on this project destroyed so what we do know about this was a result of some congressional hearings in the 90s um, and really the actual details, aside from what I mentioned, is, is unknown. We don't know the, the, the true scope of this. Um, this went on between 53 and 67, so this was a long time that this was going on. Um, and on top of that, I mean, we're talking about millions, millions of dollars in uh, tax money that was allocated to this, this twisted shit. So we'll never truly know what all happened. But um, it's important that we don't forget that, that it did. And we remember the, um, the victims of this. 
at the hands of their own government, of course, who was supposed to protect them, especially children. Um, so, oh, okay, so that's the, uh, the horrible subjects. <laughs> now we're going to get uh, into something a little bit more lighthearted. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, end this here. Uh, stay tuned for part two when we talk about the uh, the great Emu War of uh, 1932 in Australia and the uh, ice dam bombing on uh, Yellowstone in 1944. Thanks for watching.